Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We are your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to another episode of the I Create Daily podcast, a movement for creators serious about their art. I'm Devani. And I'm Leora. And today we're joined by the beautiful and hilarious Lillian Oak, a best-selling author of teen and adult fantasy books. She is best known for Nataya, a Jadurian adventure. Did I say that right? Yeah, for the okay. most part. I usually just put a little emphasis on the Jadur. <laughs> Jadur, Jadurian adventure, which boasts a whopping 3.7 million online hits. Born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, Lillian moved to North Carolina where she writes full time and is hard at work on her next book. As a social media influencer, Lillian also creates entertainingly and relatable video clips about her life as a writer, mom, creator, and when she's not writing, Lillian is homeschooling or educating her horde of goblins in ways of Middle Earth and Narnia with the help of her husband, Joshua Robertson, whom you can meet on episode nine and in the interview after Lillian's. This year, Lillian and Joshua embarked on a journey of 40 book fantasy conventions where they have an awesome booth featuring their books. Lillian just published her latest book, The Lost Voice on Amazon, on Amazon Kindle, excuse me. We will, of course, link all her work in the show notes. Welcome, Lillian. Thank you. It's so wonderful to get to finally meet you. We've been like seeing and chatting um, for some time now, and of course, having a chance to chat with Joshua. And when I say hilariously funny, my experience with meeting you so far is being seeing some of the funny clips that you post just like at random about life in the trenches, right? That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I'm entertaining in any sense of the word. <laughs> well, my, my favorite clip probably on the internet so far is the clip about how you're not high maintenance and then it <laughs> immediately cuts to you frothing your coffee. <laughs> that is probably the I, I promise I'm like 100 of those views on that video <laughs> well thank you I, I will credit you when that makes it big <laughs> yeah. we're gonna link we'll that one link because it. it is the funniest thing ever yeah and yeah. That I'll is, have to go reshare that on my page too <laughs> yeah absolutely and it's just one of the things that makes the internet amazing yeah so you want to start all right so let's start how did all the writing and book publishing and this world become your life. What is the journey from wherever you want to start? Yeah, like how did, yeah, how did your, your passion, your creative endeavor become your work? Good question. I would have to say that it really goes back to when I was a kid. I want to say around 10 to 12 years old when I was um, running around with my brothers and the neighborhood kids and role playing a lot, except that I would take my role playing very seriously and become very emotionally involved with my own characters. (laughs) So by the time I hit around 13, I decided to create one character that I was always going to role play. Mm -hmm. And in whatever world I was playing in with whatever friends, I was always that single character. And my best friend did the same thing. So when we were about 13, 14, we're like, well, we made up characters. Let's make up this whole world too. Uh, this world is what has turned into J. Dor. This first book the, um, in the series is actually based very much on these characters that my best friend and I created when we were kids. And probably around the same time when I was 13 was when The Lord of the Rings came out. And the first moment that I saw the commercial the, for the trailer for The Lord of the Rings was when I... I lost my mind realizing that there's people out there who create fantasy worlds and then they share them with the world. And I also realized that day that I'm not the only nerd in the world, the only female nerd. (laughs) So um, that was a a big push for me when I was able to actually see visually this medieval fantasy world come to life on the screen and decided that I was going to do that too. And so I started when I was 14, my very first book, 
which was titled something differently, but is now The Lost Voice. So The Lost Voice is the book I've been working on since I was a kid off and on and really wanting to share it, but haven't really had that confidence that I do now in my own writing to really put it out there. Wow, that's fantastic. And how about your childhood friend? Have you, is she still, are you still in, in touch with her? Oh yeah, I just spent about three hours a few days ago talking to her, reading the scenes of the character that I based off of her <laughs> uh, for the next book because um, it's very much the personality of this character is so much the way she was in high school and it, a lot of it really is how she still is these days too. So uh, we, we keep pretty close contact still. We're I mean, we have a whole country between us, <laughs> you know, she's in Colorado, I'm in North Carolina. So, I mean, uh, we really just spend a lot of time talking on the phone whenever we're talking about the world and the writing. But I share everything with her because she was there creating it with me as a kid. Yeah, definitely. But when did you, so did you ever, like, when did you actually start writing for a living or writing and selling, like, professionally, writing and selling? Um, writing? Well, uh, let me think. About eight years ago was when I was pushing Nataya, and I did have a book that I was publishing then that is no longer on the market um, that I was pushing out through a small press, and I wasn't happy with it because I, was, I still considered myself very much an amateur. And so probably when I published The Dragon Cager, uh, last year was really when I said, you know what, this is, this is going to be my job. This is going to be the career. This is the direction that I'm going to go. And I'm really going to put all of my energy into this. So, I mean, I was, I was really building up my fan base eight years ago for the purpose of being able to, um, I guess, make them familiar with my world of J-Door. So when the series came out, um, they would know things. They would know the characters. They would know how the world works and things like that. But really, I would say that I really jumped into the publishing life uh, last year, wow. if not two years ago. So, uh, okay. So the first one is the Dragon Cager. Take us on the journey of the books, the titles, and when they came out. Yes. Natalia was um, the one that I said that, you know, I started uh, online. I was just pushing it out for free through Wattpad. That's where I was really gaining my fan base, gaining uh, readers to sort of follow me around and uh, as Josh says, stalk me in the legal, you know, ways. <laughs> and um, after I was pushing that out, I did the Dragon Cager, which that I, I started writing that when I was in college. I had about two years that I had spent um, just trying to, or not two years, it was about two semesters um, of college. And in that time throughout all of my breaks, I was writing. And if I wasn't writing Nataya, uh, more on Nataya, I was also writing The Dragon Cager. The Dragon Cager really came out of the blue. I was watching something on TV. I can't really remember what it was. I just know this idea clicked. I shut off the TV, I grabbed my computer, and within two weeks I had a novel done. And I sort of sat on it for several, uh, for, for several months before I was introduced to an editor um, that worked with Scholastic for about 13 years. And she wanted to work with me on the Dragon Cager, so after she tore that up and showed me where I, you know, wasn't doing as well and what I needed to really work on, she also really encouraged me to, to keep writing because it had a lot of potential. And that was really, I guess, when things kicked into gear and I was like, okay, well, this is like a big, a big deal. She's a big deal. And she really encouraged me and showed me what I was doing wrong and I fixed it. And now, you know, I'm, I'm happily going to go and publish a dragon cager. So I did that. And shortly after that, I also uh, rebranded Nataya and went more, more public with that as an actual published book, too. So, I mean, between that, I was doing little short stories for anthologies, uh, like An Ogre's Tale, um, which I wrote in two days. I mean, that was, a, it's a pretty short story. Bounty of the Everdark happened between there for another anthology. And... Um, the one I did right before The Lost Voice was The Thorn Witch, which is in an anthology right now called Ragged Heroes. And I will have that, I mean, once I get my, my rights you know, fully back, then I'll probably 
print that, you know, little, little tiny booklets that I'll hand out at conventions or something. But then of course the last voice just released yesterday. Wow. Awesome. And so tell us about the Wattpad experience. Like how does that work? Um, how did it work for you? Would you do it that way again? I would do it again if I, if things were the same. Um, back then, Wattpad was really just sort of starting to, to be known a little more. Um, they had been out for a few years, but people weren't really aware that they were there for so long. And so I went online and I was thinking, well, what can I do differently that's going to help me bring more readers? So I started just Googling different websites that were specifically made for readers. And I came across Wattpad. I saw that they had a lot of potential and that they were really growing in the last, uh, in the previous years. And so I contacted their, um, the woman who did their media and I had told her I was just about to get published. And if they would help me, you know, just push out my work, then I would help them push out Wattpad too. And she was really excited about the idea. So we worked hand in hand, just, I was writing every week, another chapter of Nataya, and they would put me on the front page of their website. So every week I had, I mean, hundreds of comments on every chapter from different, you know, readers that are just coming through the website. And then they all slowly started filtering into social media, into other social media accounts, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And a lot of them I'm still friends with now, and they've really been there from the very beginning of the whole writing and publishing journey for me. Wow. So, and that, I mean, that's certainly a way to force you to sit down and make sure you stay on a, a publishing schedule you know, that, that oh, yeah. you have a chapter due, you know, every week. Yes. I'm terrible at my own deadlines or, you know, even, even Josh tries to set a deadline for me and cause I'm just so bad at it. And I still fail when he, when he sets one for me, but it's like when it's someone I don't know that's <laughs> on my case about, you know, you got to do this and this is, you know, going to keep working then I feel a little more of that pressure and I, I work pretty well under pressure. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting. So I've heard that a lot from people who resist setting deadlines and such that it, when it comes right down to it, the, that pressure forces you through the eye of the needle, so to speak, to get it done. Yeah. Oh yes. It's very true. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, so you, now Joshua told us a little bit about your structure, but your interview is going to published before his is as far as your daily structure of you guys taking turns with the kids and the errands and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But for our, our audience and interview with you, what is your daily creative structure? Well, it's a lot harder now because the kids are out of school. <laughs> so it's, it's very different now. I mean, we have a couple of them that are homeschooling, but um, several of them are you know still out in schools. So there's, there's less driving around, but now you have to keep everybody entertained and doing something throughout the day. But generally we wake up around 5.30 in the morning. Um, Josh has his, uh, his online job where he teaches kids in China. I don't know if he talked to you guys about yeah. that. And um, he, it, it's just sort of like a little classroom um, where he you know, um, just spends time with, with kids in China and learning English. And in that time, I'm downstairs, the kids wake up, they come, I make breakfast. I often do have something playing in the background. Um, I mean, a few days ago, it was Lord of the Rings. And I'm not sitting there watching it, but I just let it play. And the kids <laughs> kind of filter down and, you know, they're kind of looking, well, what is this? I'm like, have, have you not been with me for how many years now? <laughs> and you still don't know what Lord of the Rings is. This is my greatest fandom. <laughs> but... I generally try to keep some kind of music, you know, to keep me in that mindset of fantasy going throughout the day. But I stay with the kids, I make them breakfast, um, try to clean up where I can without, you know, making too much noise to, to bother uh, Josh with his uh, classroom upstairs. Then when he's done, I, you know, go up, I do an online um, coaching job uh, that I have for a couple hours. And then go downstairs, we write together. We try to keep the kids contained, um, <laughs> not too, too wild, but at the same time, you don't want to, you know, tie them down so they get too, too worked up or antsy. But we, we, we generally have certain little 
hours, I guess, put together, um, two hours here, two hours there, where we can sit down and really just sort of focus on writing until the kids go to bed. And then it's really, they go to bed, we brew up more coffee, turn on our music, and we really get at working. Wow. wow. So it, it's a lot of, you know, just parenting in the middle of everything, trying to keep the house under control and clean and laundry done. And it's, it, it's a lot, but we try to work as much writing in there as we possibly can. Well, and so what you guys are doing, we had that conversation with Joshua as well about how, you know, for us and our family of entrepreneurs that we're working, you know, seven days a week, uh, 12 to 16 hour days. And he said that you guys are often working 16 to 20 hour days, but one of the, mm-hmm. but it doesn't feel like work when you love what you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. and exactly. so, you know, so that makes, that's, what makes it work is that you're doing what you love and that fuels it. But it sounds like the other part is that, you know, after the kids go to bed, you guys aren't turning on Game of Thrones or TV and just gelling, you know, just, you know, vegging uh-huh. on, the, on the couch, right? You are putting your own creative worlds into play, right? That's when you're yeah. getting a lot of work done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, really, it is, I, I never really realized how much of a passion it really was until I had kids. And especially when they're younger and you're trying to just sit down and write because you just feel like you have to, or it, it's almost like, you know, when you're addicted to chocolate and you just, you need that piece of chocolate. And if you can't get that piece of chocolate or coffee, you get grumpy or <laughs> you really struggle through the day until you're able to just get in that place to really fill yourself with what you're, you're it's really, it, it's hard to tell when it, whether it's a passion or an addiction sometimes, but I guess at the same time, they're sort of the same thing, yeah, but it really does make everything go fast. Absolutely. I mean, like, how can you put a lid on creativity? Exactly. You know, it's like, it's, it's that, you know, you've opened the Pandora's box of, you know, the life of the creator and the mind of a creator and ideator, and that doesn't go back into place, <laughs> you know, once it's, it's out. <laughs> yeah. So what are the one to three things like that you do? Like you're still new at selling your books for a living, correct? I mean, yeah. it's like only you're into your second, maybe third year of, of getting that out there. So is like, is Amazon your best outlet or the, the conventions your best outlet? Like what are the things that, what's selling the most books for you? I would say the conventions. It's very interesting to see how many people come up I mean they see books and they they jump on them they'll you know they're surrounded by colors and pictures and games and all sorts of things but it's it's like when you walk by this table full of books it's you you can see who the real readers are and how drawn they are just to seeing pages but that is definitely where we are really pushing out the most outside of that I would say um Facebook and Twitter I kind of use together. Facebook is really more for the people who have been following me around for a while, who know my work already. Occasionally I'll get um, a noob coming in, you know, from there, from different groups or something. But for the new readers, I typically find them on Twitter through hashtags. And, uh, huh? Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to ask you when you're going to the conventions um, and you're, we talked a little bit with Josh about this, but we did not mention the part of the conventions where you're gathering the people to your online networks. Do you guys have like sign up sheets for email lists um, or sign up or like a follow me on Twitter or follow me on wherever um, already sort of established in your routine through the connecting with people or is it just more like they buy your books and then they end up finding you because they like who you are? Well, they, it's a little bit of both. Sometimes Josh does have something set up on his computer where somebody, you know, they could just come in and put their name straight in and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, we haven't really done that recently, but that was something that we, we spent, I think the, when we first started going to cons, we were doing that a little more regularly, but we do use business cards, which you don't see a whole lot of these days, <laughs> but we do use them and we have bookmarks that are made. And so with every book we sell, we put the bookmark and the card in there and we tell them, you know, follow us on Twitter, follow us on, you know, Facebook, um, for the people who are a little more conversationalists they you could really see that they're 
almost looking for a way to to really know you on a more personal level through social media or something. So they get excited and, you know, within a few minutes you're having follows or you're having new friend requests or something, but it's, it's really a little bit of both. There are a few people who they don't even bother talking to us. They'll just come in, see a book and say, I want this one. And you sell them the book, they disappear before you even put anything in there. But then you still, you know, they tell you, well, oh, I didn't really talk to you or something. You know, I just saw the book and I loved it. Now I found you. So it's really just a mixture of things. But we really do use the cards. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have people that um, come to your booth and then go to look it up on Kindle and buy the, you know, the ebook version? Oh, yeah. We also have a lot of people who they'll kind of stay away because they don't want to be talked to they'll stay sort of at a distance and they'll kind of squint and read what it is and you see them pull out their phones and they're you know spelling it out and they'll search us to see if we're anybody known i guess or to check reviews or something Uh, occasionally they'll just keep on walking and other times they'll actually come up to the table and be like okay you know let me you know tell me about this or you know some you know a lot of them just don't really bother asking or just okay i want this one right but they they do um, a lot of people they won't buy things but they'll ask for audiobook um, if we have an audiobook and they'll buy it right there on the spot in front of us be like all right i got it yeah. so it it goes with with a little bit of everything ebooks audio print so before we move on to more like of your vision for your books and your plan for your brand just from a parenting standpoint what are you guys doing with the kids on the weekends when you're doing so many tra- so many basically you're almost at a con every weekend you know this year so far right well yes as you guys know we are a blended family and so there's my four and then there's um there's his they don't consider themselves as mine and his anymore uh, but uh, the the four that, that i brought here are um on weekends they are with their bio dad and so or with their grandma and so generally thursdays or fridays they head over to dad's house and we just have two of the boys then and they stay with either a sitter or they come with us depending on where it is and what expectations we really have of the con if it's going to be bigger people that we need to make connections with we'll generally have a babysitter if it's just you know just a regular you know run-of-the-mill con then we'll take the kids with us and they play they walk around they talk to people they always find somebody who's trading pokemon cards or playing pokemon (laughs) somewhere so they sort of find a corner with other kids that you know are there with their parents who are vendors and they just play pokemon or something right. vendor kids vendor. the world yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. speaking of kids like uh, so your story about how you got started with in the world of fiction what's one of the things that's fascinating to me about it is that when you suddenly started writing I mean, suddenly in a way started writing you basically had laid the foundation of developing that mm-hmm. creative mindset and that writing of story, you know, early on for all of those years. And it's fascinating is that's very similar to Joshua's story of how mm-hmm. he and his brother, you know, used to play for, for hours on end, you know, creating mm-hmm. fantasy worlds in characters and, you know, all kinds of things. So I'm sure when you guys first met and started connecting, there were so many parallels, right? Oh yeah. Almost freaky. <laughs> I mean, some of the, some of the parallels with, with growing up and some of the shows that we watched and the kinds of games that we played and the kinds of things, you know, even right down to the kinds of weapons you made with sticks, you know, out in the, you know, yeah. just outside. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was, there, there's a lot of similarities there. And I do wonder very often if that's just typical for writers who, um, may, I would think more towards, you know, writers of epic fantasy or high fantasy or something. Um, that that's just a thing that that comes with us all yeah Yeah. for anybody listening who's not into the fantasy or the writing world can you explain the sort of styles of fantasy and especially the types that you guys write so you mentioned epic fantasy and high fantasy and what are the differences well um, a lot of people consider them the same we try to I mean especially when we're at cons and people come up to us and ask us well what do you write and what do you write we try to separate it in, um, in I guess, this way, that uh, Josh does his epic dark fantasy. It's a whole world. There's, whole, there's entire laws. There's magic systems. There's, you know, different races. Everything that I've had up until now 
was not considered epic fantasy um, because it, it's not really delving so much into this whole new world the way that um, that that Josh has been doing it. Now we're going to have to switch it around, you know, to me doing the same thing with the lost voice because I have these other books coming out in the series of this whole world. But um, we've been saying, you know, high fantasy with traditional fantasy creatures is basically how I would sell my, my work Um, saying that, you know, I have your good old fashioned elves and fairies, dragons, trolls, minotaurs, the way you imagine a minotaur growing up or, you know, think that a minotaur looks is, probably the way it's actually going to look in my world. I try to keep it down to the stereotypes, honestly. Um, I like to write, um, and and people have been calling it gateway fantasy, which I guess from what I understand, I might be wrong, but this is what I've been um, told, is essentially that the books read in a way that anyone who doesn't typically read fantasy could pick it up and know what's going on and not be too overwhelmed with weird details or crazy, you know, names or something like that. So that people who are interested in maybe looking at fantasy can jump in and not feel too, um, I guess, confused with things. But epic fantasy, uh, sorry, what? No, you go ahead. I'll ask after. Okay. um, Yeah. I was just going to say that epic fantasy, we consider, you know, where you have this, like I said, in-depth world magic systems, high fantasy, we've been saying is, um, you know, stories that still take place in another world, but don't have as much depth into it. Got it. Okay. And do you do that primarily because that's just what you enjoy doing? Or do you stick to the high fantasy that's more like gateway fantasy or whatever the term is? Um, because that's the genre. So you're, in your bio, it was like teen and young adult novels. And is that typical for that particular genre to be less of the epic fantasy or does that not matter at all? Is it just- Not really. I mean, you could have adult dark fantasy and, you know, middle grade dark fantasy. It's just, Mm -hmm. you know, it's the level of darkness that you really put into it. Um, High fantasy, again, you could really put any, any age group and they're depending on what exactly you're- you're, you're putting in. Um, I actually had this talk with a few of um, with a few of the people in my writing group about whether the lost voice would be considered a young adult or just a general fantasy. And I was thinking that the way that I had written it might come across as a young adult, but readers coming are saying, no, 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 this would not be considered young adult. Not because I put anything super, you know, inappropriate or dark or anything in there, but just the way that it's written and some of the focus that I put on different things, um, you know, certain battles and certain details in the battles, I guess makes it more of an epic fantasy um, for general audience than for someone, something you'd give to a young adult or a middle grade kid who might read something and be like, Oh, you know, you know, maybe the kid wouldn't care as much as the mom, but um, (laughs) again, not, I, I mean, I don't, I have very clean reads. I don't, you know, really swear or do any, you know, over sexualization or anything in any of my stuff. But um, really, I think it just depends on how much detail and emphasis in certain aspects you're putting into your book. Um, but it doesn't really have as much to do with the genre. Okay. If cool. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And so you, you mentioned something about a writer's group. So tell us about that. It sounds like you you have some connections that might be supportive of, you know, all that you're doing. So what is it and how does that serve you? Well, I have my author's page where, I mean, you go on Facebook and you like it um, and really just see the updates of, you know, what I'm publishing or um, I'll occasionally share like snippets from my projects on there. So people can kind of get a taste of the kind of stuff that I write Um, And hopefully, you know, create some more interest in whatever book I'm pushing out in that time. Um, And then I have my writer's group, which you, you know, have to request to get in. And generally, I let anybody in. Um, It's not very big right now. Um, I do try to keep it to people who are really, really readers um, that spend a lot of time reading and have really seen some of my other works have you know are sort of up to date on how I write so that's where I grab my beta readers that's where I go in and I ask very specific questions about 
you know, writing processes or how to get through a scene or I ask for advice or I ask readers, okay, what would you like to see if this is the situation or how would you respond if this happened in a book? Would this bother you? Would this be considered a cliffhanger? Things like that, just a little more personal to the books. Well, that's a good point. So when you mentioned writer's group, I was picturing like, you know, a physical thing locally, but of course I should have figured that it was a social. Oh, oh. Yeah. no, I'm a hermit. I don't leave all that much. <laughs> we can relate. We can relate. So <laughs> physical group. What are you talking about? <laughs> Even? Not touchy. No, no. <laughs> right. So, um, but th this is an important point for someone who is an author, artist, whatever. Um, but in particular, we're aware of the struggle for fiction writers mm -hmm. to create groups and followings around fiction work mm -hmm. um, because it's like mm -hmm. okay, so like if you're if you're a self-development person and you've written a self-development book then you know there's a, a whole genre of things you can talk about in your group and ways that you can serve them and coaching that you can do and what have you but when it is that it's fiction built around fiction in particular singular or, or series then what are the what what is some of the advice that you can give folks about the things that you do in your Facebook groups in your social groups that that the audience enjoys and that helps you to grow those? Um, probably one of the biggest things um, besides sharing snippets is actually um, investing in quality art. And if you can't invest in art, then find an artist on DeviantArt or something and ask permission to use their art just to put paste on Facebook as, um, as, as I, you know, say character visuals or, you know, just a visual of a certain scene or a place in your world that you could say, you know, this, you know, here's a visual of this character, what I imagine this character looking like art done by this person. And so not only do they get pushed out and, you know, they might, you know, reshare your stuff too, but you have good quality art that really draws the eye and it's not stuff that you just see on Google or just stock photos or something. And so it, it makes it a little more customized to what you do. Um, I recently have noticed um, in the last few cons that I've been going to that people are drawn to my covers because they look like video games. Yeah. And so my, um, a lot of my audience is actually gamers, which I didn't realize, but that's just how it's going down and I accept. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I try to stick to art that actually looks representative of um, some kind of video game or something, which um, my, my, one of my artists, I'm like, losing my, my tongue here. Okay. One of my artists works with Blizzard. He does some of the art for Hearthstone, uh, World of Warcraft. And so his art is very, um, I mean, it looks like World of Warcraft. And so I have lots of people coming, you know, because they see the art and they're like, oh, this looks like World of Warcraft. You know, does this have to do with that world or Skyrim or Zelda or something? And I really could say and um, that some of my stories do really come inspired by things like Zelda or Final Fantasy or, you know, certain games that the gamers all know. And I'm not lying. <laughs> a lot of it did come from that. But besides the, the art and putting, you know, pretty often um, a piece of art or something more visual um, is the, the snippets. That really, you know, taking either a small sentence or, you know, half a page of something that I've written that is really going to draw some kind of emotion, whether it's laughter or, you know, something a little more, I guess, sad or scary or something just to really mess with the emotions that really seems to draw in more interest. And a lot of times I end up getting a message saying, Oh, you know, I just read this and I went and I got the book. I'll let you know what I think about it. Or, you know, that they're going through and really starting to think seriously about what to, uh, what to pick up first from me because of that snippet that I wrote that they enjoyed. Right. So with the cover art being a lot and uh, attracting a lot of gamers, that leads to the natural question. Have you been pursuing any, and I, and I've heard that it's very, very expensive, but have you been looking into any way that you could um, create game worlds for your books, for your novels? Not yet, though I would love that, whether it's the game or a movie or something that's just more visual and actually animated where things move around. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like I, I'd probably just break down emotionally. And I'm not that much of an emotional person all the time, <laughs> at least not, you know, on the outside. 
but I mean, I had a dream several years ago of The Lost Voice actually being turned into a movie where I saw the characters and I was placed in this scene where it's, it's literally a, a spirit realm that I invented when I was about 11 or 12 years old, where I literally laid there in bed. I closed my eyes and said, I'm just going to create this place just, you know, so I, I'm going to, it's going to be where I escape when I have, you know, uh, a rough day or if I'm sad or something. And I invented this and I put it into my books and I had this dream that was extremely vivid where I was in that place with the characters and with the director and all the camera people. I woke up just sobbing because it wasn't real, but it was so, <laughs> it was so vivid. So I imagine someday I might actually get there, but a video game would be pretty awesome. And I really would like to extend out to that because as you said, I mean, a lot of the audience is, are, are gamers really. And um, they're coming with that interest in mind. So I imagine that could help big time. It makes sense that some of the gamers are also readers. Um, yeah. And- you know, and it's like they want more of that kind of world, you know, and so mm-hmm. the forest gives them another angle to something that they can connect to in the game. Yeah. Realm. So, so um, along those lines, like, what is your plan for the next books? And do you have a series already planned out, titles, all of that? Just tell us your process and where, where you're going with that besides the, the end vision of seeing it on screen, you know, whether it's gaming screens or movies or both. Uh-huh. Um, well, I do. I am currently working on the second book in uh, that follows the Lost Voice. The series is called The Chronicles of Jador, and the second book is Rise of the Elders. Um, I am all sorts of all over the place because I just saw the first um, the first sketch of the cover for book two, and it's going to be the most amazing thing in the universe. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I have a third book planned. Um, and it's going to be a three book series for, um, I mean, the, the core series is going to be three books, but I do have several stories based off of different characters still in the same world, uh, that I do have planned outlined. Some of them already started. So not only do I have my artist already sort of have my claws in his back for the next several years, um, of books for book covers, um, I, I, I have the actual stories themselves already lined up. So I do intend on staying within my world. Um, occasionally I might, you know, step out and do something, um, something else. I have two projects. One that is, um, I don't know if Devani remembers, I'm pretty sure she had commented on it. I had posted something about saying, should I work on the X-Men type of story or the Terminator type of story? And I did a poll to see what would be more interesting to people. But I ended up throwing that down, you know, back on the back burner so I could continue writing in j Dor because that's where my heart is. Yeah. And that's where my greatest imagination really is because it's what I've been creating since I was a kid. Right. That's such a good point. So how do you filter all the creative ideas you have because so you just said like your heart is really in the Jador Jador Mm -hmm. series where that that is the one sort of series that for now takes up your mental bandwidth but when you do get other creative ideas that are totally different that are just you know complete out of left field how do you do you keep them do you toss them do you filter it what is the how do you determine like no I'm sticking with this for now well, it's a little bit of a hard question um, because I constantly have some sort of idea coming through. Every single day, it's something new. Um, but I do have several storylines in mind that are not fully fleshed out. So I you know, think, well, I have this little idea, the scene in mind, but I can't write a book based off of one scene. And so I just sort of write it down. I often just write, I actually write the scene down. I have my computers full of just scenes from random things that are never actually, you know, finished yet or not finished yet. And occasionally I'll come up, I'll come up with another idea and think, oh, well, that's a cool scene that I could put into something. And then I start thinking of my other project ideas, my outlines of stories that I don't have a full plot yet. I'm like, what, which story can I insert it into? Mm-hmm. So I have sort of my backlist of, ideas that can potentially be, you know, an awesome book outside of the J-Door series. And I typically take ideas that come from whether it's something I see on TV or a conversation I have with the kids or just something that comes out of the blue. And I try to apply it to one of those stories because my J-Door series is so 
fully fleshed out already that I don't feel like I need to put more there. (laughs) So it's just sort of an actual, like I'm actively thinking about which story I I could put a certain scene or an idea into. Awesome. Do you create um, like a daily goal of writing X number of words or do you just go flow with however much you can get done in this amount of time? I started 2018 saying that I'm going to have every day I want to write 2,000 words at the very least. That has, it it worked as I was writing The Lost Voice, and I mean, I finished the book um, that way, but it's a lot harder now when the kids are out of school, that you can't really just sit down and write for hours anymore. And so it's, you know, somebody always needs something or, you know, somebody's hungry, obviously, you know, you have to have your three meals a day and then snack time in between and, uh, you know, kids start fighting. So you have to go, you know, be referee for a while or get them out of the house or something. So I've sort of let go of that thought that I'm going to write down 2000 words every day. And I just sort of go with the flow now and try to not get frustrated. (laughs) But I, I always look forward to the end of the day I mean, even before the kids go to sleep, just knowing that things are going to start winding down and I could sit and, you know, sip on some coffee and at least start looking at my, whatever the current project is and start sort of preparing myself for when they do go to bed and I get to sit down and write quickly. Right. Do you guys include your kids into any of your creative processes or world building or fantasy building? Has that come up yet? Have they shown their own like interest in all of that? Not so much. Uh, one of one of um, our girls, she is not a reader whatsoever. She just does not care to read. And I actually, I caught her one time when she was sitting at the table and the other kids were upstairs or outside and she was sitting at the table and I don't remember what brought it up, but I had just finished a scene that was a really big deal to me. And she was like, okay, mom, like, what's wrong with you? Because when I get excited, I just start singing or prancing around the kitchen. Um, I, I, I get a little weird and they recognize that, oh, something happened. And so I started telling her and I actually played out, like I physically played out the scene as I was describing to her what happens. And I caught her finally in that moment, just sort of, you know, big eyes and mouth just sort of gaping open. It's like, whoa, that sounds really cool. And instead of, oh, can I read this book? It was, are they going to make a movie? This should be a movie. <laughs> like, why can't you just pick up the book? <laughs> but that's about as close as we really have any of the kids interested. They just, unfortunately, they're not, they're, they don't have the passion to read. One of them does. Um, I mean, she reads through books, I mean, really quick if she, you know, picks one up that she's really into. But generally, they could really care less what we do. We try to discuss, you know, fantasy worlds or fantasy movies. We try to plop them down with us to watch something. Um, the Seventh Son was actually, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. Um, it's, it's a great fantasy movie. Um, I don't think so. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We'll look it up. We, we saw the previews, but we never watched it. Yeah, it's kind of an old movie, too, but it's just, it's hilarious and it's the whole medieval you know fantasy um type feel to it but we forced the kids to watch it with us and they did enjoy that and so we were able to talk about stereotypes and fantasy books and things like that and um you know our one bookworm being able to actually discuss what she's seen you know in certain books and things like that but they we we could try as much as we want but they really don't care to be involved (laughs) That's so interesting because it sounds almost to me like whatever it is the parents are doing, they're not going to be interested in it right now because it's like, it sounds like, you know, what mom and dad are doing, what you guys are doing sounds like, like the ideal scenario for many kids. Uh huh. Like, you know, I know it would have been for hours with like Coleman, my husband is now a fiction author, but neither one of us were when our kids were growing up, you know, and so, yeah. and definitely I wasn't. And so, but they, but the kids were always interested in reading and reading fantasy, reading fiction, watching the movies and trying and writing their own stories. So it's so funny that here you guys both are, you and Joshua both are fiction authors, fantasy authors, and the kids are not yet into it, but you know, you never know, right? It's like, it's, it's perhaps just because it's so familiar that it's yeah. not, special um but I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of their friends not some of their friends um read your books or know about them uh-huh um i mean we've had a couple of their friends actually 
um, you know, just sort of walk in the house and see boxes lining a wall that are just boxes of books for our cons. And they'll go in there curiously and just sort of look in the box and be like, oh, are these books? What are these for? And they find out we wrote them and they generally take one of mine just to be able to go read and they come back and tell me what they think about it. But um, I mean, we do actually bring it up sometimes with the boys that often come to the cons with us that they just don't care to be there anymore. And we're trying to tell them, we're like, there are kids who would just love to just go and spend a day at a con just to yeah. walk around and see things. And they just don't like it anymore. They're bored of it. And it's nothing special to them. So so what do they say? If your kids aren't into reading so much, most of them, what is it that they do instead? Um, it's either video games or outside. They do role play a lot, which I very much encourage. Um, I'm glad to see uh, sometimes they get a little rough, you know, with, you know, tackling each other or, you know, whacking each other with a stick or something, but they are using their imagination. They are role playing. Yeah. Um, um, the bookworm of ours, if she's not reading or, you know, doing something with the other kids then she's drawing. So, I mean, she's definitely a little artist. She's really yeah. good at it too. We're just kind of waiting for the others to find what it is that makes them happy, what, you know, passion they have outside of video games. <laughs> right. But, um, oh, they are actually into Pokemon cards. That is another big thing. Um, we've tried to get them into Magic the Gathering or some other kind of, you know, trading card game. Um, but that does take a lot of the majority of their time is sitting around with their Pokemon cards. Your, um, the, the child that's not interested in reading at all, I don't suppose it had to do with dyslexia. Um, I don't think so. Actually, her teacher, which I haven't seen any of this at home, but every time I have a conference with the teacher, she tells me that she loves to write. And I'm looking at her like, <laughs> all right. When? <laughs> Where? <laughs> Apparently she has a little journal at school that she writes things in. Not like really stories so much, but when it is, you know, journal time to just write about something that happened during the day or something, she really, I guess, really enjoys writing. And I encourage her to do it at home, but she doesn't. She's too busy with everything else. Yeah. And I see she's a awesome speller. I mean, she's always, you know, getting hundreds on her spelling tests and everything. And, you know, she's really good with her um, grammar and punctuation and all of that. And I'm like, okay, I could see her being into writing, but why doesn't she read? She just doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to mention this um, just because I'm sure that there are others in our audience that have kids as well, but two thoughts that come to mind. One is for both of our kids are dyslexic and our son especially was highly dyslexic. And so he reading was not fun, therefore, especially reading books that were within his range of like his ability to comprehend was much higher than his ability to read comfortably so the solution yeah. that was fantastic for both of them is, was audiobooks and it's a fantastic way to um, expand a child's vocabulary beyond again beyond their ability to read comfortably especially if they're dyslexic mm -hmm. or if they have like a very act like to sit down and just read can be a boring thing so if it's a very active child you know then that's another thing they yeah. can walk around they can walk the dog they can be outside and still listening to audiobooks um so that so that's one tip um and the other on the writing so your child that's writing um i mean even once so i don't know how old is that child the one She's that 10. So, yeah. so she could, I know that you guys probably don't have time right now, but she could probably end up finding something that she's interested in or turn some of her writings into her own blog, you know, uh -huh. and, and like, a, you know, decide kind of what kind of things she enjoys writing. Cause it may be that she ends up being, you know, a journalist, uh, a journalist kind of writer, you know, or, or, yeah. a or what do you call it? investigative reporter, or mm -hmm. you never know. Um, mm -hmm. But it, but it's there's so many opportunities these days, regardless of age. I mean, there are YouTubers you probably know who are yeah. kids, you know, 10, 15, 18, whatever, who are making already a full time living just from their pa following their passion and putting it out there online. Obviously, under mm -hmm. the supervision of parents, you know, in the in a scary social world like that, or what can be. So so that might be something to explore. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm really sitting here thinking if audiobooks might actually do good for her. Um, I mean, she, she has, I think, the issue with the comprehension, like you said, that was a big struggle for her. 
through um, the last two years where, I mean, even the teacher was pointing it out and I'd have to sit and really practice with her just trying to, you know, just focus on comprehension. That was a big struggle for her. Um, and now that you say it, I wonder if um, audiobooks might actually do good for her. And I have a few that um, she just, she just got a music, like a little music player for her birthday a few days ago. So now I'm thinking, all right, well, we're going to put a book on there and see, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> see how that goes. Said she was interested when you were telling her the story. So that, yeah. with her, you know, so in particular, so some of the story, like one of the stories that audiobooks that we've had that listened to over the years that has excellent, um, what do you call actors reading the part uh -huh. is Golden Compass. The Golden Compass oh, is, mm -hmm. is a, it's just a very well read acted out book. So I, let's see if she's 10. No, the one that, that is, has a harder time reading. How old is she? Well, oh, yeah, she's 10. He's 10. Oh, that, okay. So I'm not sure. Uh, you just have to check the age appropriateness. I'm not, you know, yeah. I, think, I think it would be probably okay for her age. But anyway, things along those lines that, you know, that are just, it, they're so captivating. They're well acted out. They're well read. Um, yeah, it'd be very interesting to know how that goes. There's, there's, there's another thing besides dyslexia um, that we have in one of our relatives where it's not exactly dyslexia, but there is a difficulty learning from um, written word to brain. And I, I don't remember the term it's, you know, but it's a, it's a similar kind of thing. So it could just be back yeah. to the comprehension thing. It could be yeah. that it's not completely, um, filtering through and that audio I'm very big. Devani's very big on audio learning as well. So that might be her thing. Mm -hmm. And part of it isn't even yeah. just a struggle in reading. Sometimes it's just the attention span that it takes. And, and like you have to quiet yourself down and get in the mood to read something. And uh -huh. when you spend a majority of your time like reading stuff online or doing internet work or re like you're always reading stuff to do your work. So it's just sort of like, no, I need to change up. I'm not going to sit and read a book. Yeah, that could be it. That could be it. So yeah. Yeah. keep us posted on how that goes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I will. I'm very interested now. <laughs> okay, good, good. Well, in closing, we've already kept you long, um, but two other quick questions before you go. One, are there any th areas that you're struggling with that you could use help with? Um, you know, like if you, that, that kind of like bothers you daily besides needing to figure out how to make it all work, you know, <laughs> whether it's your writing, whether it's your, you know, marketing or just in general, some um, advice from readers, anything that comes to mind? Well, as for struggles, I would say my biggest struggle right now is sleep, which yeah. really has everything to do with being productive. Before, I mean, I used to love my sleep. 2017, sleep was the greatest. <laughs> I was, I, that's, that's what I looked forward to is just being able to curl up in bed and just close my eyes or just, you know, listen to music or something. But now bedtime comes and I feel like I'm wasting my time. I'm like, why should I just lay in bed and sleep when I could be finishing this or I could be putting in another chapter. I could be doing something else. And it's very frustrating to be in bed now. And then when I wake up, it's very frustrating that I can't wake up fast enough because I went to sleep late. And so that's my biggest struggle is being able to actually make myself sleep well enough so that I can be productive the next day because your body eventually gives out and you can't focus, you can't do anything. You're just a grump. You have a headache, you know, you're all sorts of just, you know, confused all day and you end up just having to, to binge sleep, you know, through the day or something, which is equally as frustrating. Yeah. And but yeah. So I, so on that, um, what, comes to mind immediately is that the coffee that you guys make after the kids go to bed to you know be productive that's probably really interfering with your sleep um uh -huh. keeping your brain like when you lay down then your brain's racing all the more from the coffee yeah. um so yeah you do have to attend to the sleep it's super important mm -hmm. for the ultimate productivity so you might be fooling yourself and thinking that you're really getting more done by working uh -huh. through it rather than getting good night's sleep and then getting more done more quickly. So it'd be, it'd be worth experimenting with that for sure. Um, trying something like some herbal tea uh, prior mm -hmm. to reading time instead of the coffee. Um, even, even if it's going to calm you down and relax you like lavender or chamomile um, and help you go to sleep, then that just means you're going to get up earlier, you know, and you might have some time earlier to write. Mm -hmm. I know it changes things around, but if that's your biggest challenge, and, you know, it can affect the health. Yeah. We'll link to a, um, and we just saw this, um, was it on 
impact theory or what we just saw the thing about sleep, the importance Probably. of sleep. Anyway, we'll, we'll remember where that was and put it out there, but every area of performance is hindered if your sleep is suffering. Yeah. And yeah. I've too. seen that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. So not to mention grumpiness. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. The coffee infusions and all that. And we love all that it only goes so far. It can't be a way of life. Yeah. You know, it can be like, okay, I'm going to hammer this out for the weekend. And it or, stresses your adrenaline system yeah. too. And once that, once, once you're running on pure adrenaline, that burns out so quickly. And then, and then you're chugging coffee and it's not even helping. And you're yeah. like, why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. yeah. It's not fun. Yeah. And it happens way too often. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, work on that one. So in closing, do you have any final advice or thoughts for people who uh, are maybe getting into following their passion of writing or whatever creative endeavor? That's something that's like a driving thought that has helped you. My biggest thing um, with, with that would be let your work be torn to pieces by people who are more successful people who are, you know, up at the top, if you have any opportunity to, you know, maybe work with an editor, you know, of a big publishing company or something. And I'm talking, I mean, if you could get anybody as high as possible up in the publishing business to look at your stuff and tear it up for you and tell you what sucks and what's great and what you need to work on, do it. And do not let it bring you down to the point of not wanting to write anymore or, you know, thinking too, you know, harshly of yourself or your own talents or something. Um, I, if I would have published things in the beginning, like I did that one book that I did with the small press, if I would have gone with that and didn't let my work be torn up, there's no way I would be where I am now because I was, I was learning. It was the beginning. You know, you have to really be bad at it before you can really go out and push things out with confidence. I was not confident in myself at all because I was picking up books from other people who were successful and doing it full time. And you can tell when you're reading that they know what they're doing yeah. and it takes a lot to get there and it hurts and, you know, but, but it's, it's completely necessary to be able to take criticism and yeah. not take it personally. That's yeah. probably the, the biggest thing throughout all of my years of writing from when I first started to, you know, working with, um, with the editor that um, I had was just allowing myself to hear the negative thoughts from people about my writing so that I could focus on those and learn how to fix them. Yeah, absolutely. It helps, I think, being a parent. Um, you, can, you can know how it is that uh, your children benefit by following your advice and, you know, by taking feedback, et cetera. And it's like, because they don't know it yet. They're learning. Yeah. And so same for new writers, mm -hmm. same for us with, you know, even seasoned writers, you know, seasoned editors, there are always ways to improve. That's the name of the game. So absolutely. And, and what's the fun in like knowing every little thing about something before starting? Like, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, like that's half of the, the journey and that's half of the reward is how much you get to learn. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's just a mindset. It's like, instead of taking it personally as, you know, like wounded because I'm not better, you know, because that's a little bit of a perfectionist mentality as well. It's and like, ego. you know, ego, it's like, I thought it was good and I wanted it to be better. And, you know, so there's that, you know, like, ouch, you know, if someone else didn't think it was better yet, which sometimes even the writer at that point didn't think it was better either, <laughs> but, you know, uh -huh. but they worked so hard already on that part. It's sort of like, rather than it's like changing the mindset to, you know, wow, you know, how can I make this better? You know, like, okay, so I, you know, I wrestled with this and I forged it, but, but, but what needs to improve, you know, because then that's yep. the next, that's the next horizon, right? Yeah. I think about it a lot, like, uh, like working out, you know, you're trying to, you know, get some nice, you know, biceps, you're going to have to work it out and it burns as, you know, the muscles are breaking down so that they could build up and be stronger and be better. Exactly. And that's what I think I've, you know, spent most of my time telling myself when I felt really down on my own writing um, mm -hmm. after, you know, being criticized or something. But I mean, I went out of my way finding websites where that's what they did. You would submit a piece and they would choose who they would, you know, do a critique on your first chapter, your first two pages or something. And that I was all for that. I spent so much time just finding those websites so somebody could tear down what I'm doing so I could make sure I'm doing it right. Yeah. And did you find any of those situations where, you know, because there's one of the things about art, you know, whether it's writing or painting or whatever, sometimes it's also subjective, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we've all seen the million dollar paintings and you're going, really? 
you know yeah right. really that's, you know, the, million, that's, that's the, the one that's a million you dollars. know so so it's a subjective thing I mean, I mean i think that writing uh is a little more clear perhaps when it's really well written versus when it isn't whereas visual art you know is mm -hmm. a lot more subjective but have you encountered any feedback where you just basically you, you took creative license to disagree you know it's like okay, yeah helpful but yeah i do that um mainly because i i i use it with my own branding too that i keep things um to a certain extent stereotypical fantasy because i want to keep that very basic traditional feel of fantasy going in my stuff i mean i see everybody doing everything else creating you know new creatures or new uh languages or something and i'm just like i i love this old you know yeah. what's already there and i want to play with it and i want more people and kids to grow up and be able to find what i found magical and so when it comes to things you know your stereotypical tolkien-esque you know elves or dwarves you know dwarves living in mines or um, you know, elves being tall and slender and, you know, these magic creatures, you know, immortal. I like to play with that. And I choose to use that in my writing and use it in a way so that I do still have an audience for that, believe it or not. But there's an audience for everything if you know how to zone in on it. That's right. Absolutely. This is the era of the long tail. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely. And if you love it, then there are going to be many others like you who also love it. Because some people don't want to read something that takes like because you know you you dive into some books and so and it's just like i have to spend so much bandwidth trying to figure out what you're talking about and all this yeah. new stuff you're inventing That's and true. and sometimes yeah, it's like so. no i just want to like read a book and get lost <laughs> like yeah. i just want to read a book and i don't want to have to like figure out like what are you talking about yeah. who's talking now you know yeah. you just want to read a book to sort of like escape that yeah. whatever That's very much how i was my 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 whole reading life yeah. Speaking of those kind of books, are you familiar with the story, The Wind Boy? I am not, actually. I'll send you the link, or you can look it up. But The Wind Boy, it was one of um, my favorites when the kids were younger, and we read it together. And I just so loved that book. It was just like, uh, and it's a little bit, it reminds me of what I think. I have. I don't read fiction right now, just because I'm so focused on brand building. Um, oh, right I, now, she means like, for in this the past years in this era of life i grew up reading fiction and and i was a you know an avid reader i devoured books all the time but i haven't in recent times so but if i did i think i would enjoy things like your voice um sorry the the lost voice I, from what i imagine from the descriptions what it might be mm -hmm. so i think you might this one's a little bit more on the older era the wind boy uh -huh. in other words the, the art and all that would definitely look more like, I don't know, 1800s, 1900s, kind of, probably 1900s, yeah. it's kind of soft, as opposed to more like a game world. Mm -hmm. So it's not a yeah. game world, but the story itself has a really fascinating theme. So you might enjoy that. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely look into that. All right. All right. Well, I know you don't have time to read right now either, but so, you know, who knows for your kids, maybe an audio book if they have it, they do have an audio book for your, your daughter that you meant, you never, actually, it's a CD, it's not an audio book, so never mind. But anyway, Lillian, your uh, pen name is L.F. Oak, correct? I have two, and there's a reason for that. Um, Lillian Oak is the, the work that I could hand off to anybody, kid or adult, and know that, I mean, it's, it's all ages. L.F. Oak, I'm going to focus that on um, stories with darker themes, um, not in the sense of, you know, graphic or... Um, you know, and anything, you know, language, you know, bad language or something like that, but just in the sense that it's more mature, um, you know, more mature situations in life, you know, or, you know, like circumstances, you know, in life and things like that. I just on a more emotional and psychological level is going to be the LF Oak pen name. Well, that's, that's smart. That makes a lot of sense. That's good to know. And then your readers, um, your readers will come to know that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's Hopefully. Great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Well, good luck. Oh, sorry. Let's tell us just one more thing. What's the synopsis of The Lost Voice? Like, what's that world? Oh, well, do you want like the actual synopsis, like from, um, you know, like the back of the book, the, the blurb, or just like a general? A general description, whichever you prefer. 
Okay, well, the last voice follows um, Kaya, who is the descendant of one of the gods. The gods in my world are called the voices. Um, they are the voices of Jador. So she is the voice of Apan, which is the voice of water. And the four voices have been killed, and she is one of the next in line to become a voice. And um, an immortal bodyguard named Arkai shows up and um, takes her to go and essentially start um, being prepared to pick up this, this load to become the, um, the next god, one of the next gods. And turns out that she is the, the I'm trying to, to think of the best way to explain this. I, that this is why I have this, the blurb on the back of the book because I'm really terrible at just talking it up. But essentially she's, She's not safe. Um, you have the Sinstarians, which are um, inhabitants of the eastern you know, part of the world, that they don't believe that the world needs any sort of god or any sort of uh, you know, leadership over them, that they should all be able to do what they want. And so they're out to kill all the descendants, um, everybody in the bloodline of the gods. And so they wipe her memory. They take Kaya, they wipe her memory, and they push her into a world where there's no magic so that she can't be tracked. Um, they push her into our modern day world. It's a, it's a portal fantasy. So um, part of the book is in Jador as she's learning what's going to happen and why it's going to happen. And then part of it takes place in the modern day world um, up until the point where Arkai crosses over to get her back because in the time that she's been gone, um, her and the other voices, all of Jador is starting to fall apart because the world thrives off the balance of the elements. And these are the gods of the elements. And so the world is withering inhabitants are starting wars against, you know, each other race against race. And you, they, they need the voices back to bring this peace back and stop the world from crumbling essentially. So they, uh, the problem with her is that there was an issue when she was first crossed over and she lost her memories for the most part. And so Arkai tries to help her remember her bloodline, who she is, why uh, she was sent over and return her to um, back on the path of learning to be a voice of Jador. Wow. So it's only the, the first book is really about that crossing and her regaining this memory of who she is. Um, there's a big ongoing theme throughout it. Um, I don't know if you've heard the term cutting the cord. Um, cutting, you know, issues and people out of your life that aren't good for you, that are keeping you from, you know, obtaining what you, you know, the goals that you put for yourself or what kind of life you want to live. And there are people holding you back and um, ideals that are holding you back. And a lot of the story goes through her struggling to let go of these ideals and let go of these emotions um, that she has connected to certain people or places and learning to cut it off so that she can be her own person and less dependent on other people. And, um, you know, the, the way she was raised, the, um, the rules that she believes applies um, to, to her, though they really don't when you're a god and you need to protect yeah. this world. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of that, that theme going on in there. It sounds fascinating and definitely sounds like something we would enjoy picking up to read. I hope some in our audience will want to do that. And remember that the lifeblood for authors are buying their book and leaving reviews. Yes, <laughs> yes please. So thank you so much, Lillian. And um, we look forward to seeing your next books coming out and following your journey. Thank you very much for having me. It was great talking to you guys. Same awesome. here. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.